quick sympathy on. All right. So everyone, thank y'all so much for watching this evening. I have on the line with me, Miss Melinda Butler. She is running for seat 42, which is our Lawrence and Union Counties House uh, representative. And we just want to know a little bit about you tonight, Miss uh, Miss Butler. What can you tell us about yourself? Yeah, thank you for having me, Mandy. So I'm Melinda Butler. I am an attorney, but I'm also a small business owner. I've been uh, owning my own business for 12 years now. Um, the time that I've been in practice, I actually uh, graduated from Union County Schools and went to USC Union, uh, which I know we have a branch of USC in Lawrence. And then I went on to USC Spartanburg. And, and for my law degree, I went to a Christian law school, Regent University in Virginia Beach, which is uh, Pat Robertson's law school, essentially. So um, I, I came back from uh, Virginia Beach to Union and uh, been here ever since. My family's here, so we've raised our family. I'm actually um, a wife and a mother of five children and a grandmother. Um, so I have, I have some extensive, I, I know I don't look like a grandmother. I, I know I get that all the time, so I have to go ahead and, and uh, put that out there. I have a, a two-year-old, uh, uh, she'll be two in August, granddaughter. Um, and uh, my oldest son, my, my, and these are my biological children. I have to kind of clarify that, qualify that sometimes. But my oldest son is 25. Uh, my youngest son is six. So there's a 20, my 20 year difference in there uh, between my first and my last. And then, uh, and then that grandchild in there. So I have some life experience. Um, and also in raising my children, I have three grown children and still two that are in school. Um, here in Union County Schools. So I'm very interested in how we can make this education work for all children um, and not just not just some, but for all and, and how we can move forward with that. And that's really the reason I want to be a part of this. I want to learn how I can effectively help us um, as a school district and, and especially with the times that we're going through because things are are really going to be different, I think. And we have a lot of opportunity, I believe, that we've saw through Zoom and teaching, you know, teaching through Zoom and, and all the different avenues that are coming about. So I am very eager to learn and to work with your school district and, and uh, the school districts in general um, on, on how we can move forward and collaborate together. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And that sounds like you've got a wonderful and chaotic family there. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, it's peaceful right this minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can take the blessings when you get them. <laughs> uh huh, that's right, yeah. Well, um, we're going to shift over to our question and answer piece. Um, so, what do you think, or what is your opinion on the state of public education in South Carolina right now? What do you think is going on in education right now? I think the public education in general, so. It, it's um, it's definitely in different times, and I, I think we're going to have to be innovative with it, just the same as we're being innovative in other ways with with restaurants and everything. I think we're going to have to treat the public school system the same way, and and figure out what's going to work best going forward. I think what's happening is, you know, we really hadn't focused too much on the math and the science. That's that's what's needed for what we're the kind of the the error that we're in now um, and that we're going to have to put some focus there. Well, I think we're going to have to put some money there. I mean, instead of us building and I'm an attorney, so I'm going to say it straight up though. Um, instead of us building new courthouses and government facilities, we really need to be focusing on our schools and, and putting, you know, putting dollars into our schools and fixing them up and making them and, and maybe not just the physical building, but we've got to collaborate. We've got to figure out why are we losing children? Uh, why are they not graduating? When I say losing them, that's what I mean. Why are we not bringing them to uh, to fruition? Why are they not going on to uh, deal with the, the higher education? Um, because, you know, that's a problem that we're dealing with globally is with the outsourcing going to the other countries is because we don't necessarily have the, you know, the kids are not falling in line to, to pick that up. So um, I, I hope I answered that question. I, I Went off a little bit, but I really, I really think there's innovation has got to be, but we got to put some dollars behind it. But we, if we don't know what to put the dollars behind, um, so I, that's going, that's going to be, you know, some real, 
some some research that's got to go into it not just for our state either i mean this is this is something we're dealing with dealing with globally um south carolina the good thing about us and, and i'm you know south carolina all the way i was born in south carolina in union south carolina where i still live um only been out of state only lived out of state two times in my life one of those times was during law school when i moved right back and another time was when i was a teenager my mom married and moved me to georgia for just a little bit a very short period of time that i was there but uh but south carolina is uh, we're we're able we're able to soak up new stuff more than some states are some states are just completely you know against change I think that as South Carolina as a whole, though, we'll embrace stuff. If we see that it's good for our children, we'll embrace that. And so that's that's one hopeful that I have is that we can all kind of come together on that and, and make really good decisions with the right advice. We got to have the right people giving us the right advice. Absolutely. So speaking of um, funding, you know, if elected, what would you do to address the funding in public education? You know, our funding formula hasn't really been updated since the 1970s. And so what would you do if elected to help fix the funding issue that we do have in South Carolina? I think it's going to be a great opportunity for us to um, uh, rework the budget here with everything that just happened that we're still going through, but coming out of uh, with the with the coronavirus, the emergency that was put into place, the pandemic, whatever we want to call it right this minute is going to give us wonderful opportunity going forward that we're going to have to rework the budget in all areas and school is going to be right there with it so i don't think we're going to be able to not rework the budget in the school in the school area based on what happened now and how we saw schools shut down and and have to pick up you know have to pick up virtually and have to continue to to, to nurture the children and to teach the children in the way that we did so i think it's i think it's a must i think it's it's not even going to be a question of can we i think we're we're going to have to there's no way around it Absolutely. So how would you improve public education if elected? You know, I mean, I, I don't have the answers to that. I really don't. I I struggle really hard myself because, um, you know, with my grown children, all I had uh, my, my oldest, he went completely through public school. My two um, next to him, so my 20 year old and my 18 year old, when they hit the middle school years, we put them in a private school. And so, because we were struggling there with the balance, we really, it didn't work. It didn't work well, you know, even for us. So I, I don't have the answers to it. I really want the answers. That's why I'm on this call tonight. And that's why I even reached out to some of the teachers here and said, hey, can we do, um, can we have a talk? Let's, let's see if we can. It, it's very difficult right now, I know, to get together and talk. But, but here's a forum that we're talking in. So I'm going to encourage, you know, our teachers here with this video. Hopefully, if I could share that with them, I'm going to, I was going to ask your permission for that. Sure. Um, because I think it's going to take us jointly working together to figure that out. But I want the, I want to hear from all the players, from all the people who are doing this on a daily basis. So, uh, the experts. That's how we do in court. So, you know, I'm not a, a child counselor. So we bring the child counselor in to testify as to the best needs of that child. Um, and that's what we need to do in this situation. We need to bring all the players to the table and we have to collaborate. And we're, we're serious now. Like we really have to do something about about the public education system. It's no, it's no more you know, we can't just wait on it to kind of fall in place anymore. It, it's It's got to be. Absolutely. And that would certainly be a breath of fresh air to actually have uh, people up there at the state house asking teachers what their opinions and thoughts are. That would be a, a breath of fresh air for sure, because I know a lot of times it's the current teachers that aren't asked those types of questions. You know, how do we do this and how would you benefit from doing that? And uh, I think that would be a, a wonderful turn for the positive for our students and for the the state as a whole, because you know, in education, our goal is to build a better community in the future by educating our children now. And so if if they're not talking to the people who are doing that, then it's kind of hard to to make certain decisions when you're not really speaking to those who are in there with those children on a daily basis. 
it's very surprising that they have not put together committees involving the teachers. You know, anytime there's um, some legislation being made, usually they're putting together a committee. Like um, if they're going to if they're going to enforce this, they'll put together a, a, a judge panel or a lawyer panel. If it's if it's affecting the laws, you know, they might put one judge, one lawyer, one lay person, one person who's been a defendant, you know, to have a, a committee of people who have different insights from different backgrounds. And so teachers absolutely have to be involved in that process because you're on the front lines. You're the ones that's doing the teaching. We're not. So we have to, how do we know what's best and, and to make the, you know, without getting the input from the people who are doing it on a daily basis. So I'm surprised that they're not already involved in that way. I, I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine going forward and not having that involvement. That's just, it's critical. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. It's certainly frustrated on, frustrating on our end when we aren't taken into consideration um, and when we try to, to speak out against something that we know is just not going to work and, and they don't want to have anything to do with what we've said. So that can be very, very frustrating. It's like you didn't ask us to begin with and we're telling you it's not going to work. Yeah. It, it yeah. can be difficult. So what do you believe is the top issue surrounding education in South Carolina? What do you think is our number one problem? I think developing in children a love of learning. We're forcing so much on them that we're not letting them get comfortable with the material and, and come into a comfort level and confidence. See, they have to build that confidence um, and I'm not a teacher so I'm, I'm just speaking from what I feel uh, what I've seen if they're not building the confidence and mastering that one subject they don't have the confidence to move on to the next subject so us forcing you know them to to do this and do that without uh, we, we just have to develop in them the, the you know the, learning is good learning is fun learning is not to put you down and learning is you know it's not to show you where you're failing it's to get you ready to go to the next step. And if we can't, if they're not passing at this level, they really don't need to go pass, you know, go to the next level because they're just not ready. And I know that it makes some, you know, makes us look bad sometimes, but even my six year old, like he's not, uh, his spelling, you know, he's math is his, is his strong suit, but spelling is not. So, I mean, there's work that needs to be done. And, and um, instead of, you know, moving him on to the next level of spelling, he's got to get this level first. And I understand that and his teachers um, understand that. And so that's what I think it is. I think that we just have to work, uh, work on their level. It's not, on a, it's not on a global level. It's not on a standardized level. I might be, I, don't, I might be over speaking there, but I just, I think it's, I think it's individualized and we have to work individualized. Absolutely. Um, and a lot of our teachers do do that for, for the children. And I think um, working and having the, the ability to be able to do that in a better setting and, and a little bit more freedom to do that more openly would be great. So that kind of comes into our last question is, um, you know, state testing. We've been able to cancel state testing because of the pandemic and learning is still happening. Kids are still growing, kids are still progressing. So with that being said, what are your opinions on those accountability measures? Kind of like what you were just talking about. So, you know, what's your thought about all of this mandated state testing that, that's, you know, is it truly necessary in your opinion? So I think that, you know, there's always gonna be testing, um, but testing for the sake of testing is just a waste of everybody's time. I think the testing needs to be to figure out where the child is to help the child to the next level. It's not to justify the numbers or the dollars. And that might be where we come in and we need to, you know, have tax dollars evenly distributed. I know um, I hadn't, hadn't looked into it all the way, but, but it, sh it, maybe it shouldn't be based on the test scores of that particular school and what industries are in that particular district. Maybe it should be based on uh, the test. We're going to have to do the test. I had to take a test to get into law school. And, you know, you had to take your test, you had to take your, your bar test or license and test for, um, for the 
school and I, I think that's always going to be there but for edu for elementary students especially and 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 maybe the higher grades I'm not sure at what point you would start uh, what st what point you would start transitioning that but for the elementary school uh, students particularly use the test and to, to figure out where they are not to judge the you know judge the teacher or judge the the school district itself what's what good is that doing us right well and i know it's very different when you look at a lawrence county for example school district and you try to compare that to a greenville county or a chapin school district um or your know, the lexington and richland school districts versus allendale school districts i mean it's very hard for you to compare those to each other because what we have in Lawrence, you don't see in Lexington and Richland and what they have monetarily and with sometimes parental support, you don't see in some of these Allendale and Lawrence counties. Um, so we, we all bring different strengths to the table as school districts and, and to all be measured by the same thing is is difficult because rural districts do have an this have a disadvantage monetarily which brings in less resources for those students so and and if we're going to be if we're going to be measured by the same standards while we're not having the same money that's right just, <laughs> that's, i completely completely agree as a lawrence county teacher and I get to go visit some of those schools in Lexington and Richland and I look around and I'm just, I get building envy if I'm, if I'm going to be honest with you, I, I'm like, wow, wouldn't it be nice to have something like this for our kids? And then I look at, you know, my building, which is still in great condition, but every now and then we've got a, a leak in the roof or, you know, the, uh, we just don't have the same amount of money. We we have to reuse old and broken equipment sometimes, and they might get brand new equipment every year. But it's it's definitely a difference. You can't say we all get equitable um, learning. There there is no separate but equal. That I mean, I just don't see it right now with the monetary difference. Mm -hmm. with all of these districts, and so you you have districts that are definitely much more ahead. Than, than these rural districts that are suffering. And we, we try to keep reminding them that we are suffering. So yeah. if we're gonna be measured the same, like you said, Ms. Butler, we definitely need to be getting the same amount of money. Yeah, we're a state, we're, we should be concerned about our state as a whole, you know, not our, um, just because the state of South Carolina in general needs to come together on it, not just the, the districts here and there. And I understand that's, a, you know, that's much, much, much easier said than done. Um, but the collaboration can happen, though. There's no reason that it can't. There's no reason, you know, the teachers can't, a teacher from this district can't come together with a teacher from this district and a teacher from the lower district and put our heads together and then bring the legislature, you know, uh, the committee in to hear from all of those involved to figure it out how, how we go about doing that. Our schools are our most important, you know, in our churches, we always say, if we're not bringing up the next generation into the church, the church is going to die out. And that's the same with the schools. If we're not raising up the generation to have a love of learning and we're just forcing this down their throat and making them hate school because they feel so, you know, and, and I know it's not the teachers. It's, it's not the teachers. It's, the, it's what the it's what the teachers feel like they have to accomplish um, regardless, you know, if the child got it or didn't get it. Um, and so I just think that we, we have to really be able to let our teachers teach, you know, to the individual student. So. Absolutely. Is there anything else with regards to education that you would like to speak on this evening? Um, can I can I ask you a question and, and maybe whoever else is on here about, uh, about what's been y'all's biggest obstacle um, in the past? couple of months or have you felt that you have um, even maybe resonated with your children more because you said you know you didn't have the testing but they were still learning so can you can you kind of give me an insight on that absolutely um I, I definitely see that students are going to keep learning they're going to keep doing despite the fact that we don't have a test hanging over their head so I think a lot of the kids are still have that spirit of perseverance they're, they're going to keep learning. They're going to keep doing. 
and and I've gotten a lot of positive remarks from the students about you know you know thank you so much and I'm working really hard can you please be patient with me I mean very sweet interactions that I've been able to have with the students um, however as a state and being in a rural district of Lawrence County some of the, the issues that we're having is a lot of our kids do not have internet access and so while we do try to do packets of learning for those students if they don't have internet access that the communication piece between the teacher can be a struggle um especially if the teacher is, doesn't feel comfortable giving out the personal phone number because you know there are boundaries there that you have to be aware of but um mm -hmm. I know you worry about the kids who aren't getting support at home. And um, I, I have several students who do work, but they work from as far as on school work. My students being high school students, they're working from the hours of maybe 1 p.m. until 12 a.m. And so I'm online with them sometimes until midnight trying to help them through because they're having to go to a physical job in the mornings uh, they're having to be the bag boy or they're having to pull carts in from the bilo and they have to work at the bojangles so a lot of our students being rural students parents might have just lost their job due, the, due to the pandemic a lot of our students are having to work jobs or babysit um, try to teach their siblings and so it has been a struggle to try to get them to do the work on time, but they're so precious and so respectful about, I promise I'm going to get it done. I promise I'm going to get it done. And there are a few that I have not been able to contact at all. And that's as a, as a mother, as a teacher who loves her children, that concerns me. I'm worried about them. I haven't seen you. I haven't been able to put eyes on you in two months, two and a half months. And I'm worried about you because I can't see you. I can't talk to you. And so that is a little concerning, but we're making it work. I mean, so many kids are doing, I, I've probably got 98% of our students working. And I will say for Lawrence County, um, our county got on the ball from the moment of the quarantine. I mean, one of the things that we've heard across the state is Lawrence School District 55 in particular they knew what they were doing. They got started the moment the governor shut the school districts down. And a lot of schools, um, I, I don't live in Lawrence. I live in a neighboring district. So I don't want to uh, poo poo them out loud, but um, it did take them a couple of weeks after the governor had shut things down before they could kind of get things together. So mm -hmm. that, that says a lot about a rural district like Lawrence, who does struggle with technology compared to some of the surrounding districts that has more money, that they were able to get those kids learning the moment the governor put that out. So that that's a positive note on our district. Okay, yeah, good, good. And that's what I would say, like the motivation, you know, that's, that's very inspiring that the high school students are still motivated to, to get their work done, even though they're not in, the physical setting because I think if we can I think it all comes down to if we can find the way to keep our kids motivated um, and I think that it comes back to not worrying about the test score but worrying about are they loving learning are they loving this um, because if they love that then we know that they're going to carry that through for the rest of their life and um, so I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very encouraged to hear that you have uh, high school students that are uh, motivated. That's awesome. Well, and it, it really too depends on that relationship that you've built with them. And thankfully, even though I was only with them for a couple of months, I was able to build that that relationship with those students that they felt like, not that they were letting me down, but that you know I like. I like Miss Lloyd. I don't want to let her down. Um, and so to the point to the point where they're messaging me, I promise I'm going to get it caught up. Don't worry about me. I promise. Give me a day or two. And it's like, it's okay. We're in it together. You just let me know when you need help. And I'm right here for you all the time. Don't worry about it. We will get to it. And that that relationship back and forth, I think, motivates them to want to do it. 
And that, that starts with the teacher right there. I mean, you've right. got to build that relationship with those students. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I feel all the way. That's that's what I deal with my clients. I represent um, appointed clients a lot of times that are involved in DSS actions. And if you don't, you have to work at the relationship to build that up for them, you know, to have that rapport back and forth to where what you're saying, to where there's some accountability in place. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're developing that along the way. So, yeah, I, I, that's awesome. Yes, the relationship. Absolutely. Well, and if you have any other questions uh, for me as you go through this election journey, feel free to email me and I will be happy to give you any information that I can. And we'll be posting this on our SC for ED webpage, which will go across the state as well as we have a local page. And I will email you the link if you want to share it out to anyone you can as well. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, I might hit you up with a couple questions for sure. Um, um, I'm, I'm very eager to figure it out. Um, our students are our number one priority, no doubt. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much again for speaking thank with you. us tonight. For those who are watching, this is Miss Butler. She's running for seat 42 in our Lawrence and Union counties for House of Representatives, and we certainly appreciate you talking to us this evening. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Have a good night. Good luck in your June primary. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.